we might just jump straight into our reading for today, I think. Matt's going to be speaking us to us a little bit later on the Holy Spirit, continuing that series, and he's given us a number of readings in preparation for that. So let's run through those now. Thanks, Greg. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 to 21. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, welcome to our Sunday morning service. Uh, my name is Matt, in case we haven't met, but I think we all have, so that's good. Uh, gets one thing out of the way. Um, and I'll be, as people have already referenced, continuing the sermon series that we've undertaken on the topic of the Holy Spirit. One of the great things about talking about the Holy Spirit is that you really have to try hard to make it boring, uh, I've found. It's, uh, it seems to be something that most people, at least within the church, are interested in, which is good. Uh, so this week and the next, I'll be looking at the more overtly supernatural manifestations uh, of the Holy Spirit. Supernatural manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So from the outset, I thought it'd be worth taking five minutes to cover off where I think we as a church stand on these. And by overtly supernatural, just to make it abundantly clear, I'm talking about such things as tongues, healing, miracles, uh, words of knowledge, things that are, that, that are explicitly, clearly supernatural in nature. So. Here's a very simplified version, if you like, um, of positions, different positions on the supernatural manifestations uh, of the Holy Spirit. So these, if you like, the risk is these are caricatures, these are extremes, but nevertheless, hopefully they're useful. So on the one side, you have what's commonly referred to as the cessationist um, position. Cessationism, sensational. So this is the view that there were such things as tongues and miraculous healings uh, in the early church, and they're certainly mentioned there in Scripture, but they were usually associated exclusively with the early church and were utilised to witness initially to God's existence and his miraculous powers. This means once the church had actually been established and the apostles and the other early church leaders had died, those gifts, they ceased with them. I think that there seems to be both a bunch of scriptural evidence that this isn't the case, as well as the testimony of church history and even a lot of believers' experience, if you like. So I personally don't hold to this position, and I think it'd be safe to say that it's not MCC's stance either. Again, the risk is that's an extreme and, and that's a bit of a caricature. But then there's the other side and the other extreme. And this position can be unscripturally prescriptive in what it believes regarding the Holy Spirit. It states that every Christian must demonstrate the clearly, overtly, supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. So what do I mean? Um, a common example is saying that someone must speak in tongues in order to be or to demonstrate that they're Christian. And that belief, it still does the rounds. I heard an example of it um, that was Hobart based only a couple of months ago. Um, and I'd say again, this flies in the face of what we read in scripture. It also flies in the face of what many people experience, myself included. Um, and if anyone wants to take up either of those two positions afterwards, please just, just grab me afterwards, happy to discuss it um, further. Um, another demonstration of this kind of view, of this extreme position, is, um, is, by giving, um, is by giving those kind of those supernatural, often ecstatic experiences, it's giving them supreme authority. 
For example, you may have come across people uh, who claim to have the gift of prophecy and expect that their prophetic utterances will unquestionably be given the same weight as the Bible. Or when they prophesy, um, they do so in the first person of God and imply that they have his complete authority. So I, the Lord, say, and then expect that people will take that unquestioningly. And again, I'd argue that that's neither biblical or discerning. Instead, that's just flat out dangerous. And it's also a bit, if you like, insulting to what we believe about the sufficiency of the Bible. So do people have the gift of prophecy? Sure. Should they be given the opportunity to exercise that gift and be listened to? I say definitely. Should the church that they belong to be encouraging that gift and welcoming of it? I think so. Do we accept those prophecies on face value without using our God-given discernment or by weighing it up with what the Bible says? I'd say definitely not. Definitely not. Uh, And if you're interested, there'll be more on prophecy and quenching the spirit and testing prophecies and a whole lot of other uncontroversial um, topics next week, if you want to come along for that. That's when we'll be expanding that stuff further. Um, So just to kind of wrap up this little intro, we can't can't please all the people all the time. And the church, no doubt, will continue to debate and speculate on the theology of the Holy Spirit until the return of Christ. But surely, like amongst all that, the most important element that we can't lose sight of is what do all these different beliefs result in? What's the fruit? Um, Are we, as a church, to bring it back home, are we characterised as loving Jesus and doing what he commands? That is, loving each other, loving the community and letting other people know about Christ. Because if not, of course, you've got to wonder how much value our worship, our teaching, our speaking in tongues, our prophecies actually have. You know, if we aren't being transformed by the Spirit into a community that's characterised by love, then I'd suggest we're just playing games. You know, we're, uh, we're just resounding gongs and clinging cymbals And the only people that we tend to fool in that case are ourselves. Uh, The risk is this can become such an in-house discussion and debate. Channel Church's Care helped someone out last week, gave them like um, uh, some vouchers, maybe a food package. And this person was so grateful and just so moved by a demonstration of love. I don't think they had any interest in our position on the Holy Spirit and the more overt supernatural gifts. That's like further on down the line. It still matters but I'm not going to suggest it's the main game in town. And the risk is this becomes such an in-house discussion and dissension and, you know, um, disunity can spread from it. It's okay. So that's all by way of introduction. The element of the Holy Spirit's work that I really want to focus on today is being filled by the Spirit or being full of the Spirit. Uh, You're probably familiar with that term. It's it's part of common Christian kind of parlance. Um, And I think that there are three ways in which the Bible speaks of being filled with or being full of the Holy Spirit and I'm hoping to unpack each of those one by one. Uh, Now, the first and most common way in which Christians are filled with the Spirit is when they actually become followers of Christ. And Tim covered this well only a couple of weeks ago in uh, in his talk. For a brief recap, you can look at Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Famous little verse, You, however, are controlled not by your sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. He or she does not belong to Christ. So upon acknowledging Christ or Jesus as Lord, asking for his forgiveness and determining to follow him, we receive the Holy Spirit who then dwells or lives in us, which is another way of saying God, his power dwells within us as well. So in this sense, every Christian, every follower of Christ is full of the spirit. So that's that. That's hopefully relatively simple and I don't want to spend too much time on it because, again, Tim's already covered it. Then there's the second sense of being filled with the Spirit. And if the first sense about being filled um, is related to becoming a follower of Christ, the second takes place following that. So if you've got your Bibles with you, please take the opportunity to turn to to the passage um, that Helen read out before. So that's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 21. Ephesians 5, 15 to 21. And I'll read it out again too. Um, Be very careful then how you live, not not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. A couple of things there straight off the bat. One that's kind of interesting is that you've got the entire Trinity mentioned there in those couple of verses. You've got the Spirit, you've got God the Father, and you've got the Lord Jesus Christ. All the Godhead mentioned just in those couple of um, verses. It's also a really interesting passage because, believe it or not, it's the only one of its kind in the entire canon in Scripture. It's the only example of the specific command to be filled with or be filled by the Spirit. But of course, being so unique can make it a little bit tricky to interpret because there's no other passage you can put it side by side with to get a more comprehensive meaning of what that term actually entails. But what we can do is take a step back and look at the context in order to get some direction as to what that means. So we can remember that the audience for this letter was a group of people. So again, probably local churches in Ephesus. And this letter was circulated amongst those churches and it would have been read out loud to the entire group or congregation. And it's really helpful to remember this straight off the bat because um, it means that the you, and this is obviously something that we always lose in you know, translating from the Greek to the English, the you was plural. So a more kind of accurate rendering would be yous, or if you want to go American, your. It wasn't, so it's not addressed to me, Matt, the individual, in isolation. It's to you, plural, the group of people there. And that makes sense because a big theme all through that letter is unity in the church. So if you jump back to chapter 2, verse 22 there in Ephesians, it says, God has created the church to be his new temple, the place on earth where he dwells by the Spirit. So again, the focus for the letter is on the church, a unified group of people, as a place where God can dwell, more so than the individual, if that makes sense. And God, through his Son and Spirit, has established that unity between people. But again, what's really interesting is that people, we, together, are still responsible for doing what we can to maintain that unity. As we read in chapter 4, verse 3, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But that, of course, begs the question, how do we maintain that unity? And this is where we really get into our passage and what it means to be filled by the Spirit. <clears throat> you can see there are four elements of that filling, if you like. And it's worth noting, all those elements are relational in nature. That is, they're concerned with how individuals relate both to each other and or God. So if you like, you can break these down into two dimensions, a horizontal dimension and a vertical dimension. And the vertical dimension, the first example of that is singing and making melody to the Lord and giving thanks. And by vertical, I mean it goes from people up to God. So there's those two examples there. So making singing and making melody in your heart to God, to the Lord, and giving thanks. That's the vertical dimension. But then there's the horizontal dimension, which is concerned about our relationships with each other. So speaking to each other with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and submitting to one another. And in context, when we gather, our meetings are not to be debauched or out of control as though we've, we've all been drinking. That's what we read in chapter 518. The inference, I suppose, being that previous to these guys being converted and following Christ, that was relatively common. When groups of people met up, there'd be lots of debauchery, lots of wine, and things get a little bit out of control. This is a contrast. Because instead of that, the Spirit is to fill us, us again, collectively, us being his temple, with these other centered person, whether that other is God or each other, our peers, with these other person-centred practices. And that's what I think it means to be filled with or by the Spirit in the context of this passage. This other-centred um, person, if you like, unity is crucial. So we've already talked about the fact that the command is written to a group of people, the yous, but look at that line about making music in your heart. It's actually singular. So it's heart, not hearts. So it's the heart of the church, not the heart of Matt, the individual. So the group of individuals, the church, is meant to be so unified that they can be said to have one heart between them. That's interesting, isn't it? The church has a heart in that regard. And lastly on this, there's the question of whether these four other person-centered practices are the means by which we're filled with the Spirit, or do they lead to being filled with or by the Spirit afterwards. 
Or to put it another way, do we practice these four things in order to be filled by the Spirit subsequent to those? Um, or sorry, in order to be filled by the Spirit, or do we practice them and then subsequently are we filled by the Spirit? And most of the commentators that I read concluded that it was the first and the former. Doing these things, these four things, actually practicing these practices, that is how we fulfill the command to be filled by the Spirit. So it's not a separate experience that comes after and separate to acting in this manner. So if you want to, in other words, if you want to be filled, if we want to be filled by the Spirit, we do these things. And that's how we are filled by the Spirit. It's not a case that we do these things and then afterwards we get a shot of the Holy Spirit, if you like. And that's important. We're being Spirit-filled, if you like, when we gather together and are other person and God-centered in how we behave, think and feel. That's being filled, that's being filled by the Spirit. And maybe there's a risk that it sounds a bit underwhelming compared to what usually comes to mind when we think of what it means to be spirit-filled. But again, just consider what church, um, what church is in the book of Ephesians. It's a group of people that are a temple to God and His glory. And again, in Ephesians, there's this really strong contrast between that new temple and the old way of being together. And that contrast, I'd argue, should still be present now. So when we gather together, I'm here to serve you. I'm not here to feed my spiritual consumerism. When we gather, we should be so thankful to God that we can put aside the differences and the gripes that normally separate people, or at least put distance between them. When we gather, I should be able to submit to you and put aside my needs in order to meet yours. And in theory, this isn't a kind of added extra thing that we have to do as Christians. Instead, being filled by the Spirit in this regard is just a way of kind of reflecting a fundamental reality. That is that we have the Spirit, we are God's children, and we're unified as a result. We're a spiritual family. And that unity should look markedly different, if you like, to how other groups of people behave when they gather. Does that make sense? So that's, I'd suggest, the second way that Scripture talks about being filled with the Spirit. But then there's a third. And um, some great examples of this. is um, These are all from the book of Acts. So Acts 4.8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, duh, 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 Acts 4.31. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Acts 6.5. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and so on and so forth. And in addition to these examples in the book of Acts, you see examples of the Spirit telling people stuff, so giving them direct specific knowledge. You see the Spirit blocking people's paths, as in don't go this way, go that way. And all through Acts, there's these, these characteristics of um, people speaking boldly and powerfully. And these examples are often attended by the miraculous too. So in describing this third way, this third manner of being fooled filled by the Spirit, I have to confess my limitations. Um, I'm now going to try to speak on something I'd like to experience and I'm hopefully open to experiencing but haven't actually experienced um, a lot firsthand. Um, whereas I'm sure some of you guys have. I know some of you guys have. So in these verses and others, all of them from Acts, we have these examples of um, followers of Christ being filled with boldness, being filled with conviction and surety and often precise knowledge that usually results in them knowing exactly what to do or what to say in specific situations. So, for example, you have untrained, previously terrified fishermen, someone like Peter, suddenly turning into this phenomenal preacher who has the courage to get up in front of thousands of people without any preparation. You have Paul, who can have the certainty, and it will take some certainty, to call someone a child of the devil and then, have effect, and then have them effectively struck by God. You can have Philip being told by the Spirit one day, go here, don't go there. And you can have the regular, everyday, otherwise unnamed Christians of the time speaking the, world, the word boldly in a really hostile environment. And those examples are obviously supernatural manifestations of being filled by the Spirit. And through, again, church history, and chances are, and some of your own experiences, we know that these undeniably supernatural occurrences occur. 
Um, I've heard people describe them to me personally in terms of degrees of intensity. They almost blaze, if you like, with the spirit and the certainty, direction and conviction that it brings. Um, it can be accompanied with almost a kind of ecstatic joy. In other instances, it's been accompanied by a almost like a, a supernatural resolute calm. The common theme through all the examples that I've come across seems to be that it's out of the ordinary. It's a heightened experience, but it can't be ignored or denied, regardless of how uncomfortable it may make you or myself feel. And most importantly, as we've just read, it's also there in scripture. So a few points on this. Um, in all those examples from the book of Acts, this feeling of the spirit seems to take place in the broader context of followers of Christ being filled in those other two senses of which I've already spoke. So these guys were already filled with the spirit in terms of having them indwell him. And we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they were devoting themselves to teaching, to prayer, to fellowship and communion. So this third, more, um, shall we say, unique filling of the Holy Spirit, it didn't take place in isolation. It didn't come out of nowhere. It was preceded, if you like, by these other two senses, if that makes sense. And that's worth noting. Secondly, in the book of Acts, the broader context was one of the church being actively missional. So they were the first missionaries. They were testifying about Jesus and speaking of him boldly and suffering for it. And Christ promised his disciples in that context in Luke, when you were brought before rulers, etc., don't worry about how you're going to defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. So this didn't arise in the context of the church being inward looking at all whatsoever. It involved followers of Christ talking about Jesus and the, and the Spirit providing special assistance and support in that context. And thirdly, when I read this stuff, being a relatively objective and rational 40-something male who is uh, all the more hungry, if you like, for transcendental and ecstatic experiences, um, I crave this stuff. I really do. I'd love to be filled with the Spirit in that sense. And I think that's a good thing. Um, but at the same time, I shouldn't become, if you like, dependent on this or this happening in order to be content or to get by. So I have to see these examples for what they are glorious, to use another great Christian cliche, mountaintop experiences. A great place to visit, but I'm probably not going to live there on this side of heaven. If you look outside the church, many people who chase out of the ordinary, heightened, ecstatic experiences also have an alcohol or drug dependency issue, and it compromises their functioning. It's not healthy if something like this goes from something to be enjoyed or cherished to something that you need and that you're going to pursue at the expense of all your other responsibilities. Because fundamentally, we don't chase and worship the gift, the ecstatic experiences. We chase and worship the giver, Jesus. Does that make sense? It can be a fine line, I know. At the other extreme, I can't be sceptical or dismissive of this either. I mean, how dare I, someone like me, be so presumptuous to think that it can't happen or doesn't happen? How can I limit God's working in this way after reading it in the Bible and it being testified to both by Christians who bear the good fruit of it and it being documented all the way through church history? That'll lead to me being proud and condescending and even worse, it may even restrict, if you like, the good work that God, through the Holy Spirit, can do through me as well. So that's the line that I'm trying to walk um, and I'd recommend you guys considering as well. Uh, we see the blessing for what it is. We welcome it. We're thankful for it. We don't deny or dismiss it. And we're certainly not embarrassed by it. But we don't rely upon being filled in this sense to function or to get by. And we don't chase it at the expense of chasing Christ. So in summary, being filled with the Spirit. Number one, we're filled, we're filled with the Spirit when we, when we become followers of Christ and we accept this by faith. We're also filled with the Spirit by our other person focus when we meet together as a church. And that's something that we work at. But we're also filled with the Spirit in a third, perhaps transitory, a more overtly supernatural sense that gives us heightened assurance, conviction, boldness and direction. And we welcome this. We don't deny it. So I'd encourage you all this week 
have a think as to where you personally are in relation to this. Perhaps you could do with some more assurance from the fact that you're filled in the first sense. You don't have to doubt that you're a child of God and filled with his power. And that's worth taking some comfort from. Perhaps it'd be worth getting back to being more other person and God focused, if you like, centered when we gather together. It's, it's really interesting that the writer of Ephesians, Paul, he uses that term maintain. Because you don't kind of maintain something just, um, if you like, unconsciously. To maintain something, it's, uh, it's predicated upon having some degree of intent and conscious effort, isn't it? It's something that's got to be worked at. And again, it's really useful, I think, that in terms of what it means to be filled by the Spirit in that sense, he breaks it down into those two dimensions, the vertical and the horizontal. Some of us are going to be more naturally defaulted, I think, to the vertical. It's easy to want to come and gather together to worship God and focus on your relationship with God. But it's harder, perhaps for those people, to focus on each other. For other people, it's going to be much easier to come along and be supportive and social and fellowship with their brothers and sisters. But perhaps it's going to be more difficult for them, again, to have that vertical dimension when it comes to focusing on God. That could be worth thinking about. Perhaps, um, maybe more like where I've come from, you need to stop being overtly cynical and sceptical of the Holy Spirit filling people in the third sense. Or perhaps we just need to shift our focus or need on being filled with the Spirit in that third sense. Perhaps that's becoming an unnecessary crutch, a potential <coughs> idol that needs to go so you can refocus on Christ and be content with what he's already done and given you. Again, maybe more so than any other, if you like, I suppose, um, person of, of, of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the most kind of, I suppose, personal or unique when it comes to how he interacts with each of us as, as individuals. That'd be my guess. So I don't want to be too prescriptive about any of this stuff and say, just because I'm feeling X, you need to feel X. So they're just some ideas. But regardless, let's be a church here that keeps on striving to being full of the Spirit, both as individuals, but also as a, as a community. And let's pray that that will lead us to loving each other more and being even more effective witnesses to the people that God has placed us amongst. Because again, in the book of Acts, we see that the being filled with the Holy Spirit was usually connected to people becoming disciples of Christ, followers of Christ. So let's keep on praying that the same takes place here. I'll pray for that now. Um, Father, we thank you for your gift of the Spirit. Uh, we thank you for um, the empowerment that brings. We thank you that we can be indwelt, or that we are indwelt by him. And we pray um, that we won't take that for granted. Uh, we pray that we'll be thankful for that and we'll be convicted of that and we'll be empowered by that. And help us also be um, full of the Spirit when we gather here together. Uh, help us again more and more to have that same attitude and spirit as your Son, are willing to be a, a glad and joyful servant of others and of you, Father. And I pray that that will, um, that will result um, not in a, a kind of a church as a grind or getting masochistic about it, but more and more our gatherings will be characterised by people being selfless uh, to each other and just being able to um, enjoy the fruit of that too, Father. Um, and help us again not be dismissive or sceptical about what it means to be filled in this third sense too. Uh, help us take more chances, um, just be more intentional about being witnesses of you. And I pray that if it's your will, uh, that you'll give us some more experiences of the empowerment and the conviction that can come through your spirit uh, when we put ourselves out there, Father. So we pray that um, regardless of any of the above, we will be a community that bears more fruit, more fruit of the spirit, and we'll also be a community that can participate in your purposes of bringing more and more people to know, love and follow you. Amen.